In the student affairs profession, we talk a lot about students' development in various areas, whether it's social, intellectual, or moral. However, faith development is another aspect of development that is um, sometimes overlooked, but it's extremely important to consider when working with college students, and the theorists James Fowler and Sharon Delos Parks were extremely influential in explaining this process. So to provide you with an uh, outline of my presentation, I'll discuss Fowler and Parks' theory origins and basic tenets, as well as their limitations. I'll also discuss why faith development is important for student affairs professionals to understand, what we can do to foster it, and what particular groups it may be especially useful for, as well as a program example. To start off, James Fowler outlined his theory of faith development in his 1981 book, Stages of Faith. The theory was um, based off of interviews that he conducted with individuals between four and 88, over an eight year time period, regarding their faith conceptions. It's important to know that 98% of those he interviewed were white and 98% also had Christian backgrounds and that they were largely conducted in the Boston area. So these are some things we have to consider. Fowler differentiated faith from religion and believed that faith is much more comprehensive than religion and has to do with how people make meaning in their lives. Um, so thus he felt that it was much more a verb than a noun. He also felt that faith was a universal experience had by everyone everywhere, so simply by being alive, humans have faith. Fowler developed a stage theory that consists of six stages and one pre-stage. Pre and since he felt that individuals um, could experience regression as well as progression into later stages, he felt it was better illustrated as a spiral rather than linear stairs. Um, he also felt that individuals op operating each stage were capable of having satisfying faith experiences and that they shouldn't try to rush into the next stages. The stages Fowler developed are strongly related to age groups. In the pre-stage and first three stages, um, concept faith conceptions um, are basically um, based on those around them. These stages largely take place from infancy through adolescence, and Fowler claimed that many people wouldn't move past the third stage. However, he did believe that moving past stage three was possible, and this largely occurs during young, young adulthood as people experience events that cause them to really question their faith. Uh, people then develop their own faith conceptions, and Fowler felt that in the last stage, people are willing to give up their lives for the good of humanity, citing people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi's as examples. Now to talk about Sharon Delos Parks' work. Her theory is laid out in her 2000 book, Big Questions, Worthy Dreams, Mentoring Young Adults in Their Search for Meaning, Purpose, and Faith. She was greatly influenced by Fowler's work and primarily interested in how young adults make meaning in their lives and how colleges foster faith development by functioning as mentoring communities. Parks also differentiated faith from religion and stated that faith is the activity of seeking and discovering meaning in the most comprehensive dimensions of experience. So she also felt that faith was more comprehensive than religion. However, she felt that Fowler missed the mark in specifically discussing how influential young adulthood is to faith development and how young adults make meaning in their lives. Parks stated that colleges foster faith development for students by helping them consider big questions, such as why suffering is so pervasive in the world and what their purpose in life is. She also felt that they helped them form worthy dreams, which she said are um, dreams that people search for and are their callings in life. She believed that forming these dreams is the critical task of people in young adulthood. Uh, as I said before, Parks believed that colleges are mentoring communities, and she also said that they're communities of practice that she said make and keep life human. Through the practices of hearth, table, and commons, uh, colleges provide students with places conducive to conversation and teach them what it means to be part of a larger group, providing them with a shared identity and a sense of we instead of just I. Uh, in terms of the faith of development process, Park stated that three other forms of development influence it, those being cognitive dependence and community development. In each of these areas, individuals move from the reliance on others to being able to live interdependently and create their own personal ideologies that are not dictated them by family members, friends, or authority figures. Uh, for Parks' stage theory of faith development, she said that this development takes place in four stages. While individuals' ideas about faith are initially determined by those held by others, they eventually engage in an exploratory process um, where they construct meaning for themselves and with the help of mentors. After this exploration, they have clear understandings of their faith and they desire to live collaboratively with others of different faiths. So in looking at these theories, they're really useful for helping people determine where others are in the faith development process. However, they still have limitations. For Fowler specifically, some people have said that his theory is, mer theory is merely a description of what he believes faith development ought to look like, and they've doubted that his statement that each stage can provide satisfactory um, experiences. For both Fowler and Parks, critics have said that uh, the theories lack the ability to be applied universally. So um, they've said that the theories may be best suited for white individuals of Christian backgrounds living in developed nations, and that those that don't meet this criteria may have very different experiences that don't match up to this. 
Uh, now, in implying, applying faith development theory to student affairs practice, it's important to know that nearly half of the entering freshmen in a higher education research institute study said that it's essential or very important for colleges to help students in their faith development process. Um, so knowing that students want and expect this process to occur in college, what can we as student affairs professionals do to help facilitate it? Uh, according to a guidebook of promising practices, student affairs professionals can help encourage a campus climate that encourages students to engage in personal, in personal reflection, such as by offering quiet spaces where this can occur. Um, they can also provide students with the opportunities to have new experiences and come in contact with those that may have very different beliefs and values than their own. Um, so while faith development theory is useful to know when working with all students, there may be some groups where it could be especially useful, such as students engaging in service learning so that they connect with what they're doing to its impacts to the greater society, um, as well as students who might be grieving and may need to come to terms with the death and understand what um, death means in the larger scheme of things. Lastly, as far as a program that helps foster faith development, Mystic Pizza at Cardinal Stritch University involves faculty and staff talking with students about their own faith development journey and encouraging them to really think about the place that faith has in their lives. So really incorporating faith development into students' experience doesn't have to be difficult as long as mentors are available for them. So now to review what I've discussed, it's important to remember that while Fowler and Park's theories are useful and um, influential to faith development, these theories still have limitations. And also, since it's clear that college students do want and expect this process to, incur, uh, to occur in college, uh, student affairs professionals must play an active role in creating a campus environment that's conducive to it. Thank you. My name is Janine Bradley, and um, my presentation is on psychosocial theory, identity theory, based on research by James Marsha and Rizal and Jocelyn. Um, so I, um, through this presentation, want to help everyone understand the four identity stages and then look, we're going to look at some relevant examples based on the TV show Boy Meets World and also within student affairs. Um, we're going to look at the research that supports this theory, but really the main objective is to learn how this theory can be applied within student affairs. So there are four stages that are based on crisis versus commitment. Crisis is kind of like exploration when a student might realize that they could be doing things differently. And then commitment is when an individual decides to go in a certain direction. The four stages are not necessarily linear, although we hope that someone would end up at identity achievement at the end of the day. So foreclosure is kind of when someone is closed off. There's no crisis, but there has been some commitment towards something. Um, and generally, people retain these ideals from their families, from their parents, and they accept these values and beliefs without really questioning them. Sometimes these people move on to other stages, but sometimes they stay in, in um, foreclosure forever. Um, so we can see this from Boy Meets World. Um, Corey and Topanga kind of look at their parents as like being the ideal for a relationship and um, they see that this is really the only way to achieve relationship success is by doing it the same way that their parents did. Um, then we can see this in student affairs. Um, for, the, in, for example, like if a student is choosing a major, they might um, take what their parents think is a good major and then try to pursue that when they get to school. And they're doing so because um, it's what their families have been telling them. And they kind of do this without questioning um, and they just kind of go with what's given to them. So then moratorium is when there has been some exploration or crisis, but no real commitment to any one thing. Um, so students in this stage tend to be searching for other legitimate ways to live. Um, and they question previously held beliefs, with beliefs which tends to cause anxiety. Um, we see this with Corey um, when he realizes that he's kind of average and he doesn't want to be average. He thinks he can do better than that. Um, so he rejects the values of his parents in search of something else and he desperately searches and searches for other things that he could be doing. Um, we see this with our student who's maybe thinking of a major. Um, they might, you know, try on different majors, maybe take an introductory course, um, maybe, you know, go talk to a department to kind of look at other possible majors that might fit their interests. And then they might start to realize that there are other options available that um, they could be pursuing. Um, then we have identity achievement which is when there has been crisis or exploration and now there is some sort of commitment towards one thing. Um, and some have said this phase is poorly named because identity is not necessarily something that can be achieved per se. Um, but student, students in this category tend to be more self-assured because they're committed to one certain thing that they're gonna end up doing. 
Um, so with Cory and Topanga, um, we see um, in one episode they really think that they can afford a house and then they find out, you know, that's not going to be for them. So they have to end up in a terrible apartment, but they really commit to it and they make it their own and they follow that through. So um, they've kind of achieved that identity of living in an apartment. Um, students who are choosing a major might actually decide on one, um, but after going through some sort of exploration. Um, and they, they make a decision based on what they've learned. Um, so someone, you know, starting off as a business major might take an intro to sociology course and then they might decide that sociology is for them. Then we have the diffusion identity stage when there has been no crisis and there also hasn't been any commitment either. Um, an individual may not have explored any of their options and they seem to kind of be drifting along in space. Um, they may not be motivated to seek direction or explore any of their potential options and oftentimes they're looking for other people to give them answers. So we see this in um, Corey Matthews' brother, Eric. Um, once he doesn't get into college, he doesn't really know what he wants to do. He's kind of searching for something, but not really committed to searching and just kind of floating around in space and hoping that something will fall into his lap. Um, students that we see that are in diffusion, um, they may not have any major or career uh, um, ideas. Maybe they can't even identify any of their interests or values at this point. Um, and they may not be motivated or interested in being in college. And a lot of times they're going to look for other people in their lives to be giving them the answers to these questions. So where does all this research come from? It starts with Eric Erickson and his eight stages of development that he developed in 1968. Stage number five is actually identity versus identity diffusion. And this um, sparked the formation of the psychosocial identity theory that Marsha and Jocelyn followed up with after the fact. Marsha was the one who really honed in on looking at identity through crisis versus commitment, um, which made it easier to study this theory empirically. Um, he conducted a lot of studies along with other researchers to discover different aspects for each of the four identity stages, like their tendencies, um, what their personality traits are like, and different things like that. However, this tool, that they also developed a tool um, to help determine which identity status different people were fitting into, but the tool was really unreliable when they tried to use it to predict women's identity stages, um, and women at this time were not really studied holistically, and mo most of Marsh's research focused on men and cast women in a narrow light. However, then um, Jocelyn started conducting her own research because she realized there was a lack of research on women in their identity development. So she had conducted a longitudinal study that followed 60 um, college seniors in the early 70s and then followed up with them um, a little over a decade later. And she published that in 1987 in the book Finding Herself. Um, she wanted to see whether identity formation in college would impact the lives that women led later on in adulthood. And all of this research, though, is still very narrow. I mean, it's a very small sample size, and it's not very easy to generalize it to the greater population. A lot of this research is also really outdated, um, but it is still helpful as we try to work with our students and meet them where they're at. And we can really use this when we're trying to empathize with our students and understand where they're coming from. Where do they fit along the spectrum? Um, so that's what I hope you guys will take from this presentation as you work with your students. Um, and then I have some references as well, but that's my presentation. So my name is Jennifer Curry, and we are looking at critical race theory today through the Pachacacha lens. So what is race? This is traditionally defined as a phenotype, that is, physical characteristics such as hair, color, eye color, skin color, face shape. So common features that people may share. And it's also important to think of other considerations, not just race. Ethnicity is a factor when discussing CRT as well. So ethnicity is traditionally defined as a common nationality or cultural traditions, as well as having the same origin by birth or descent, not necessarily your current nationality, where you came from rather than where you may currently be. It's also important to think of nationality in addition to ethnicity when race considerations, and that is traditionally defined as belonging to a particular nation, your current citizenship. Um, it's oftentimes also considered, though, an ethnical group that does form part of the same nation. So there are other considerations for critical race, such as biological issues, and this is our friend, the scientist, Carl Linnaeus, who in 1735 is uh, char characterized as the first person who 
characterized the four races by geographic location and skin color. So he determined the homo sapien Europe, African, American, and Asian, so our traditional categories of race that we consider today. Also, more biological issues from our scientist Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who in 1779 also is cited as placing the first value judgment. He studied a race in the Mount Caucasus area, which is where we get the term Caucasians from. And he assigned that they are the most beautiful of race and also that is the birthplace of men. Some legal issues to consider when thinking about race um, are the, importantly, the 1790 Naturalization Act that limited citizenship to free white persons. Also, um, the Indian Removal Act and Chinese Exclusion Act, um, the removing Indians from their territory and limiting immigration to 10 years, and then the executive orders of the Affirmative Action Act. Um, social issues such as ra for race is uh, racial formation, which is made up of four major components. So human input produces and defines race. It's looked at as a part of our whole society that includes class and gender. Also that it changes, the meanings of race change quickly and they're constructed in relation to another, not in isolation. A tenant, some of the tenets of CRT include that race is an inherent part of our society. It's always going to be something that they consider permanent and that it is socially constructed. So it's a learned behavior. It's something that's taught. We're not born this way. Um, another tenet includes also um, addressing racism uh, relies on the stories of people of color. So some of the um, more vocal advocates are here, of course, um, Nelson Mandela, W.E.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King, and Cesar Chavez. So much of what we may know or what the popular opinion and information on race is based on some of the advocates that we see here and their stories. Another tenant includes that ancestry and physical appearance will still influence judgments today. So I think maybe most of you would be familiar with the Trayvon Martin, George Zimmerman case, um, which was a highly debated racial uh, aspect in the legal courts. And then also a kind of racial profiling photo of an African American man being arrested by white policemen. Um, another tenant is that the dominant culture will concede or change only if there's a benefit to them. While the Sandra Bullock's motives of adopting a baby may be pure, I thought that this highlighted the fact that uh, there's a benefit to her by supporting a different race. Um, some of the models of CRT include racial and cultural identity, so the minority development looking at it through the lens of white identity, and the components of the racial and cultural identity include conformity, dissonance, resistance and immersion, introspection, synergistic articulation and awareness. And this is the Atkinson, Mortensen, Sue, and Sue model. Another model includes African-American identity development. This was made popular by Cross and then later revised. So the three concepts of this model include personal identity, reference group orientation and race salience, how important race is to a person. And then in 2001, it was revised by Cross and Fagan Smith, and that used a lifespan approach, so echoing Erickson's model. And then another model is the white identity by Janet Helms, which includes two phases, and each phase has three schemes as depicted here. There is the abandonment or internalization of racism. Phase two is the defining or evolving a non-racist identity with the relevant contact, disintegration, reintegration, pseudo-independence, immersion, and autonomy. Other models that um, there are less research that have been done on it include the LATCRIT or Latino identity development, which um, has been made popular by Ferdman and Gallego. Also Asian American by Jean Kim. Uh, Native American or American Indians um, is made famous by Perry Horse and then multicultural. And this is a multi-theoried theory, so I think it's important to consider theories such as Holland's theory of belonging. So while that originally applied to vocations, it can be applied to our students and how they relate to their environments and to each other. And in college, um, you can see how they start to identify with potentially people who either look the same or think the same. It's also another theory, um, is Schlossberg's theory of marginality and mattering, that marginality can occur when they're taking on new roles, such as coming to college. And if they don't feel like they matter, they could develop isolation or depression. And also her transitional theory, the support vector is very vital, letting students feel like they have a strong network so that they can personally ident ident uh, develop a positive identity. Um, how we define ourselves as practitioners, I think, is also important to understand where we are in our own development and that we may change and things may shift for us as well. I think you have to realize where you're at in order to meet students where they're at, especially with working with diverse populations. 
Um, again, for students, of course, too, their shifting perspectives, um, their understanding of their own race and their importance will change, may change. Um, it could be very important to them at some times. It could not matter depending on their setting or who they're around. Um, and again, students are humans. They process in their own time at their own pace, and they can flip through their stages as well. Some of the limitations to the theory include that it is often critiqued that it depends too much on the stories of other people, um, and that there is a lack of research, especially when it relates to higher ed and student affairs, and that the dominant culture is often the ones who are defining the theory, and that it's often not thought, it's not thought of as solitary theory, so we have to consider ethnicity, class, and gender. That's me. Hello, my name is Victoria Fahey. I'm a graduate student of the Student Affairs Counseling Program at Bridgewater State University, which is pictured here. This presentation is a project for my student development theory class, and we'll be discussing cognitive development. This presentation will be covering two theories that serve as the foundation for cognitive development. William Perry's theory of intellectual and ethical development and women's ways of knowing, which specifically address women's cognitive development. To start, the question, what is cognitive development, must be asked. This is best illustrated in a quote from Baxter McGolder, student affairs expert. The evolution from viewing knowledge as certain and possessed by authorities to seeing it as context-dependent judgment based on relevant evidence is what researchers call intellectual or epistemological development. William Perry was a Harvard professor and counselor. Perry conducted interviews with Harvard and Radcliffe men at the end of each academic year. From his interviews, Perry created his 1968 theory of intellectual and ethical development, which includes nine stages and four key concepts. Perry's theory is made up of dualism, which takes up positions one and two, and transitions to multiplicity, which is positions three and four A. Relativism is next in positions 4b and transitions to positions 5 and 6. Commitment takes up the last three positions, 7, 8, and 9. Dualism, which is positions 1 and 2, provides transition to multiplicity. In dualism, the world is good or bad, and students rely on all-powerful authorities to tell them the truth and is what is right. As student affairs professionals, the students are looking towards us to find out the truth. Multiplicity, which follows dualism and takes up positions 3 and 4a. Students in this stage remain loyal to their authorities and no single authority has all power. Students in this stage will move between good authorities and bad authorities. Relativism, which is positions 4b and 5, 6. At this point, uncertainty is temporary for students. A right answer will be eventually be found and students in this stage will evaluate information through evidence and begin forming their own ideas and opinions. Students may begin to turn away from their authorities at this stage. Commitment is the final stage and takes up positions seven, eight, and nine. In this stage, students recognize commitments must be made. Students make those commitments and define their personal choices. Students then take responsibility for those choices. From Perry, we are transitioning to women's ways of knowing. Authors Mary Field Blinkley, Blythe Clinchley, Nancy Rule Goldberger, and Jill Tarul wrote Women's Ways of Knowing, the development of self, voice, and mind to document women's cognitive development in 1986. The authors interviewed 135 women, which included recent graduates and students of diverse backgrounds, including diverse ages, classes, and ethnicity during the late 1970s. From these interviews, the authors created five perspectives. The five perspectives il illustrate how women view themselves and understand their world. A quote from author Nancy Goldberger from 1996 explains the importance of this work. We wanted to understand and describe the variety of ways women go about making meaning for themselves in a world that devalues women's authority and voices. Silence is the first perspective. In silence, individuals are voiceless and powerless. 
Individuals are subject to all powerful authorities. Silence can be self-imposed or externally imposed by others. Students who are silent are fearful and have no voice. The next perspective is received knowing. Individuals in received knowing can receive and reproduce knowledge from external authorities. However, individuals are not capable of creating their own knowledge. Individuals at this stage will conform to social groups and cultural ideas of what an ideal woman should be. Subjective knowing is personal. At this point, students value their personal opinions but look to others for affirmation. Students have knowledge, but they do not have the tools needed to express themselves. Procedural knowing is learning and applying objective procedures for obtaining and communicating knowledge. At this point, all opinions are equally valid for students. Constructed knowing is the final perspective. It is reclaiming the self by integrating knowledge and voice. Individuals at this point are creators of their own personal knowledge. Students value multiple ways of knowing and have a desire to enhance their understanding of the world and their personal reality. There are limitations to consider about these theories, such as Perry who studied only white men. He had extremely limited diversity. Also, not everyone passes through all the stages in order, nor does everyone progress at the same rate. Women's ways of knowing is also not exclusively for women, but includes men. How can we use these theories in student practice? First, we need to provide dialogue opportunities for silent students to use their voices. As student affairs professionals, we can engage students in reflective conversations. We can also offer structured leadership opportunities for students to make connections and enhance their personal knowledge. Why should using cognitive development theory matter in student affairs? Since all student affairs professionals are in the business of helping students learn, cognitive development theory allows professionals to assist students in finding their voices while becoming independent learners. and I will be presenting on typology theories today. Um, so typology theories are theories that break people into different types based on their personalities or learning styles. Um, these types are usually determined by surveys or inventories that you would take. Some examples of typology theories are um, John Holland's theory of vocational personalities and environments and the MBTI. Today I'm going to focus on Kolb's theory of experiential learning, which states that people learn best through experience and where you excel in the learning process is based on your learning style. Um, Kolb got the idea for the theory while he was working at MIT and became interested in academic cultures and how students fit into those cultures based on their learning styles. Kolb was influenced by Dewey, Piaget, Jung, Freer and Illich, and left brain, right brain relationships, as well as studies on metaphysics and the theory of knowledge. His original work um, was published in 1984, and it was titled Experiential Learning, Experience as a Source for Learning and Development. According to the theory, there are four different learning styles. Um, you have diverging, which happens between the concrete experience and reflective observation stage, assimilating, which happens between reflective observation and abstract conceptualization, converging, which happens between abstract conceptualization and active experimentation, and accommodating, which happens between active experimentation and concrete experience. So people with the converging learning style are usually really great problem solvers, decision makers, and can apply ideas to practice practical situations. I thought Penny from Inspector Gadget might be a good example of this. Mm -hmm. She always tended to get uh, Inspector Gadget out of a bind when he was in trouble, so she was a really great problem solver. Um, convert diverging learning styles. Um, people who have this learning style are very imaginative. Um, there were meaning and values, and they can view situations from many different perspectives. Um, a character that would have this is Doug. He liked to solve his problems through his creativity and did a lot of writing and saw things through many perspectives. Um, somebody who would have the assimilating learning style is Brian Griffin. Um, those with assimilating learning styles, um, they have 
uh, they're very logical people and they can create theories from disparate ideas. Ryan was, he's kind of the voice of re reason within the Griffin family, so I thought he'd be a great example of somebody with this learning style. Um, those with the accommodating learning style, they're, very, they're doers and risk takers, and they like the trial and error approach um, to problem solving. I thought Ms. Frizzle from the Magic School Bus would be a good example of this, as she liked to uh, think on her feet and get her class kind of hands on um, in order to learn things. So there's a cycle that goes along with this theory. Um, it starts off with concrete experience, which is the actual experience that you have, um, reflective observation, which is what you're thinking about the experience after it happens, abstract conceptualization, which is when you actually learn from the experience, and then active experimentation, which is when you try out what you learn from the experience. From the uh, experience. Um, so in order to help you guys understand the cycle a little bit better, I came up with a little scenario called community advisor, friend, or foe. Um, you might see this a lot in students that do work in residence life as RAs or CAs. Um, this is where they kind of have a little dilemma between being a good RA or CA or a good friend. Um, so this is Laura. She is a community advisor. Um, she has a lot of friends that are CAs and those are kind of her main core friends. She took the job because she's putting herself through college and needs the money as well as the housing to help her stay in school. So one night while on duty, Laura hears loud music coming from her room. It's after quiet hours, so she knocks. To her surprise, her friend Joe, who is also a fellow CA, opens the door holding a drink. She also sees a bunch of underage students drinking and playing drinking games in the room. So Laura doesn't want to get her friend in trouble, but she depends on her CA job in order to stay in school. Um, because she doesn't want to lose her job, she documents Joe and breaks up the party. Joe is very angry with her and calls Laura a terrible friend and tells her that he's going to warn all the other CAs about her. So Laura imagines what would have happened if she did not break up the party. Someone could have been seriously hurt, gotten sick, or wound up in the hospital. So she feels like she did a good job as a CA, but she feels really terrible that she kind of betrayed her friend almost and got him in trouble. So she leaves the situation feeling very confused and upset. So Laura decides that she wants to go to her RD for advice. Her RD suggests that Laura talk to Joe and explain why she had to document him, and that it wasn't personal and she hopes that they can still be friends. Her RD emphasizes the importance of uh, communicating with Joe so there isn't any confusion within their friendship. Although Joe is still a little angry about the situation, once Laura explains her need to keep her job in order to stay in school, Joe is much more understanding about the situation and forgives Laura. He tells her that he won't give her a hard time about her job again, and they walk away as friends again. So the next time that Laura is on duty, she comes across Joe and the same group of students playing baseball in the hallway. All she has to do is politely ask Joe to take the game outside, and he complies without hesitation. He keeps his promise of letting her uh, do her job without giving her a hard time. So all is well at the end of the day. So you'll notice that there were two concrete experiences in that scenario. There's actually more than that, but I outlined two. Um, that's because the cycle never ends. It starts out with a concrete experience and you go through. And as soon as you experiment with what you've learned from that experience, you go right into a brand new concrete experience. So it's really a never ending cycle. So based on this scenario, Laura would possess a diverging learning style. Um, she saw the situation from many different perspectives. So the perspective of her role as a CA and her role as a friend, and also was very sensitive and aware of how other people would feel about the situation. So she excelled in the concrete experience and reflective observation stage. So um, important things to remember are that college students are learning through new experiences every day. Um, and it's important to know where they excel in the learning cycle and help them identify their strengths and learning styles so they can excel in future problem-solving situations. Thank you. My name is Ashley. I'm doing my Pikachka on slash works transition theory. So the easiest way to examine slash works transition theory is to think about it in relation to life. Transitions could be planned, unplanned, or non-events. A transition is essentially defined as anything that changes relationships, routines, assumptions, and roles. Examples could be getting married, graduation, a new job, 
and there are numerous changes that occur in a person's life and over time. The theory originated in the field of employment and focused on workforce transitions. Her work was dedicated to employees who were transitioning into a new role or beginning retirement. Slashberg's personal experience with change prompted her to dedicate her life to understanding transition and have a broader sense of the effect it has on an individual. While the theory originated in the world of work, many of the ideas and concepts are also related to higher education. Throughout college, there are various transitions that occur, such as moving away from home, choosing a major, and of course, graduation. Each of these possible transitions could cause a change and impact their lives from before they began at the institution. There's always change ahead when there's a transition. In most cases, the impact of the transition is more important than the transition itself. This concept attempts to explain how transition may affect an individual's life and their perception of the event. While type, impact, and context are important, the goal is to connect what the person needs to cope with during life and facilitate an understanding of what is happening at that point in the transition. This theory focuses really on the individuality of each student. Sometimes there is a there, that is defined as a transition for one may not be a transition for another. That event could be exactly the same. It is a personal decision that occurs throughout the relationship and roles for each student. When the event may be sudden, these changes could occur over a period of time. To understand a transition, it is necessary to approach the change and understand the transition that will or has begun to occur. Approaching change allows for the four S's to be introduced. Situation, self, support, and strategies. By understanding the components, a professional can understand where a student is at that moment of transition, which can unlock a new future they may not have imagined. It's also necessary to take stock of the assets that each person is going through. In this step, coping strategies and self-reflection can be utilized. Each person's stock may be different, adding to the individual nature of the change. These strengths can be used throughout the transition and can assist with the facilitation process. Now it is time to take charge of the situation. These strategies are an attempt to change, reframe, or reduce the stress of a situation. In order to process the coping strategies effectively, the student should seek information, lead to direct action, an inhibition of action, or intrapsychic behavior as the transition progresses for the student. Situation is the first of the four S's, and to understand the student is to understand how the transition is taking place. A transition can be happy or sad event that has occurred. The period isn't isolated to the timing of the event, but also encompasses factors such as control, duration, and assessment. These additional factors expand on understanding the situation that has occurred. The stage of self focuses on the holistic individual. This concept outlines the personal and demographic characteristics in addition to the psychological aspect and individual and personal views the student may hold. The concept of self is emphasized through the inner strength that a student has when a transition happens and how they then proceed through the four S's. Support can come in many different forms. The parameters of transition theory support analysis of a student's well-being in addition in understanding social support. The social relationship could be intimate, romantic, family unit, friends, professor, community advisor, the community itself, or an institution. There are several ways to look at this, but they measure social support. From there, you go from to strategies. It may be necessary to strategize during the transition process. A primary goal of theory is to connect coping strategies to promote understanding of what is happening. This S begins the process of taking charge of the transition and an attempt to change, reframe, or reduce the stress of the situation. When these forces occur, growth and development also occurs. That growth and development could be either positive or negative. In terms of transition, one must also analyze the adaptation of a specified transition, which then occurs with the individual's perception of the transition, the characteristics of the environment, and the individual, which have an effect on the transition itself. Due to its individual nature, it is a very flexible theory which can incorporate the multicultural backgrounds of diverse students. The theory recognizes the importance of global community, the impact of technology, the understanding of cultural diversity and spirituality. The theory has been revised to become more adapted to cultural shifts as the changing of the students at the college level in higher education. Assumptions are kind of like quicksand, they just suck you in. Do not do this. It is vital to counseling practices to not make assumptions regarding the students and their transition process. Consider their background as the best approach to determining how a transition may affect them, because each student is an individual. In college, everyone wants to fail in and feel like they matter. No one wants to be stuck behind or left out like an odd duck. This means each student must matter and belong. No one on campus wants to be left alone. 
And connecting on campus is really key for students in determining that belonging and mattering component, which can be found through involvement. Involvement encourages a sense of community, and involvement in extracurricular activities really helps with the transition process and the retention of students. Every student should be able to find a group that they identify with, with a common interest and camaraderie, whether it's student government, sports, or community service. College's book, college orientation is one of those beginning processes of transition. The program allows students to gain knowledge about resources available to them and their families to ease that process to the college life. The program lays the foundation for success, but is not in place once the semester really begins and many transitions begin to occur. College itself is bookmarked by two anticipated events, graduation from high school and beginning college and graduation from college into the real world. During that time in between, there may be many milestones that happen for the student and transitions that occur for them that are life-defining or change where they may be headed. Ultimately, it is necessary to understand the holistic and individual nature of the theory and of each student while offering sufficient challenge and support through the moments of change within their lives when they are trying to put all the pieces together to be successful and acclimate to a new transition within their life. Okay, my name is Jeff Sarahs and I'm gonna be presenting today on morality and student development, more specifically in higher education and the professional implications for student affairs counseling professionals. Uh, this will be through the lens of Lawrence Kohlberg and Carol Gilligan's moral development theories. So we must start by assessing the purpose of higher ed professionals. What is our purpose? We want to create holistic experiences where our students can develop cognitively, emotionally, and socially. And a monumental feature of the student development are morals. So what are morals and how are we supporting student moral development? Morals are perceptions or judgments between goodness and badness in relation to one's thinking and or behavior. Social constructs such as experiences, culture, education, family, values, all contribute and impact morals. Morals influence our behavior, our reasoning, decision making, and how we feel internally. Kohlberg was interested in decision making and problem solving and how it contributed to moral rationale. The justice perspective was something he believed wholeheartedly in. And here he believed people base ethical decisions on principles of justice, equality, fairness, and rights. He subscribed to the golden rule. Basically, do unto others as you would want them to do to you. He believed that it matters less what an individual believes is right or wrong, and more so why they came to that conclusion, how they arrived at that belief. He proposed people pass through six stages of moral reasoning consisting of three levels and two stages represented at each. Consisting at these three levels was the pre-conventional stage, the conventional level, and the post-conventional level. There is a moral development dilemma that is present at each one of these stages in order for the individual to progress. As an individual progresses psychologically and socially, they are able to move through each stage. Stage one, punishment and obedience. Here, physical consequences determine what's good or bad. Punishment is ultimately proof that something is wrong. At stage two, individualism and exchange. Essentially, what is right is what satisfies one's own needs. Here we think of the adage quid pro quo, this for that. An individual operating at this level might think along the lines of what's in it for me? I stole a cookie out of the cookie jar. Why? Because I was hungry, so I'm justified. At the conventional level, Stage three, interpersonal relationships, or known as the good boy, good girl orientation. Good behavior is what pleases others, helps others, or is approved by others. So how are we assimilating to our social roles and how are we living up to those social expectations? As this individual progresses, they move on to authority and social order. Right is showing respect for authority, not challenging authority, but respecting and remaining obedient to that authority to prevent social combustion and maintain social order. In the last and final level, post-conventional, the fifth stage arrives at social contract. So what is right at this stage is a function of individual rights and agreed upon societal standards. So we think of our US Constitution. We have guiding principles that protect our inalienable rights. And this is a guide by which we serve to maintain the social order. 
And the last and final stage, known as universal principles, basically here, what is right is internal moral philosophy, internal moral principle. An individual subscribes to an innate, an innate idea that, that human welfare trumps any law, especially unjust laws. The main criticism of Colbert was that he focused too much on males and how they reason morally. He focused more on thinking and less on emotion and behavior. Carol Gilligan came along and she challenged his theory and she believed that morals were the result of empathy. She developed the care perspective, which places significance on attachment and compassion between oneself and the environment around them. She developed the ethics of care model that consists of three levels with two major transitional points for progression. Level one, orienta orientation towards self and self-interest. Here, an individual only demonstrates a concern for caring for themselves. With time, they realize that they can impact the world around them, and they develop a responsibility for others. They move from these selfish tendencies to a responsibility for caring for others. They move on to level two, known as goodness with responsibility for others. An individual at this point will invest in caring for others. However, there's an imbalance with this shift because no longer do they place emphasis on themselves, but they are placing that emphasis of care on others. So there is an imbalance in a struggle between self-need and the needs of others. And the last and final stage, known as dynamics between self and others, a morally mature individual will find that balance between caring for others and caring for oneself. Here, the individual achieves an understanding on how to fulfill one's own needs and the needs of others. So what might be some moral or ethical issues in higher education? Well, academic integrity is certainly one, peer relationships, and social conduct. Overall, we must produce students that achieve high levels of moral reasoning and do so as they enter the workforce. Perhaps both perspectives of Carol Gilligan and of Kohlberg will best suit students moving forward and help aid in our practice as we work with our students. So just in, justice and care may be that best approach. As we aspire to have our students grow and develop, we must be knowledgeable of the knowledge of the missions and the values of our institutions that we represent. We must understand moral issues that our students encounter. We must utilize moral development theories to assess what stages an individual may be functioning at and create learning opportunities where students can grow. When students leave our doors, we want them to have the knowledge, the skills, and the insights possible to make morally sound and ethical decisions. Not only will this benefit them in their future endeavors, this will benefit our community, our country, and our world. Hi everybody, my name is Brittany Scancarella and I'm a student at Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts. Today I'm going to bring you through four models of LGBT um, LGBT development theory as pre presented by Cass, Fassinger, DeJelly, and Bilodeau, all of which build upon each other. So you'll see a common theme as I talk through the slides, how they each continue to add. Research on LGBT development has been fairly recent, so thinking of it as an infant um, made a lot of sense for me. Like a baby, it's going to become more complex and mature with time. Um, as I stated before, the models I'm going to talk through today all have a tendency to build on each other, and other models do exist, but these are the most prevalent um, and widely referenced. First is Vivian Cass's model, um, and her model was brought to light in 1979, same time as The Walkman, uh, and she believed that there were two assumptions about how we understand identity. It's a developmental process, and its behavioral changes are based on our interactions with others. There are six main stages and one pre-stage, um, and she argued that moving through the stages were based on our perception of self and our identity, and our behavior as a result of those perceptions, uh, as well as our perceptions of how others feel regarding our behavior. The pre-stage that she identified is, identi is marked as understanding that one is a heterosexual and knowing that this is the majority of um, the population. Moving into stage one is an introduction to um, a gay or lesbian lifestyle. The individual identifies that this may apply to their life. Stage two is accepting the possibility that one may be gay and can articulate that with themselves. Um, three, personal commitment. Four, integration with the community. Five, being 
um, in the pride stage, an activist, and six is a no longer them versus us, full integration. Limitations um, are shown here by our friends. It was the 70s, and she mainly studied, uh, she mainly studied men. So the 70s culture and male influence is heavily prevalent. Um, obviously, there's a need for enhancement here, so along comes Ruth Fassinger, and she introduced an identity development model for lesbian development um, that sought to expand on Cass's work. Her model is a dual model of individual identity and group and community identity. Um, individual development is understanding how you create and relate your own identity, and group development is an understanding of how your group community dynamics and how you fit into it. Um, within those two dual identities, there are four phases for each of them. The first is awareness, um, knowing that you're different and identifying your knowledge of the existence in different group settings. Exploration is a feeling of somewhat, uh, feeling of, feelings for someone of the same sex and a de desire to know more about the community. Commitment is acknowledging and committing to your identity as well as your commitment to being a member of the community regardless of um, consequences, and synthesis is a full integration of this and fulfillment within the group. Limitations to Fassinger's model include that she didn't really put a lot of emphasis on disclosure um, or the coming out that we see in other models. Um, it's a small sample size and it's also not culturally based. Um, she, her, most of her work was with white females. She also questioned how heterosexual development fits into this model. So along comes Anthony DeGelli, who introduced a fluid mo lifestyle model um, and lots of different fibers and integrations. Individuals make conscious choices to claim their identity in this model. It's not, um, it's not reactionary, it's actionary. Um, it's interactive, and to imagine his theory is to think of the iPad. Um, you know, here we have six processes that connect each other and the individual can make forward and backward movements as many times as necessary and they can go through the cycle as many times as necessary based on the experiences that they're having. So there are six processes that we see with DeJelly's model and the first is exiting our heterosexual identity, understanding that we are not heterosexual and that we have feelings for someone of the same sex. Um, developing a personal identity status and your own definition of it. Um, a social identity as it pertains to peers and societal norms, becoming um, coming out or becoming an offspring to other people who may know about this for you, um, your intimacy status, and entering the community and triumph and tribulations with that. Some limitations, um, some say his stages were a little too specific. Um, for example, the offspring stage, you know, coming out. And the um, he was the first to really integrate bisexual identity as a identity stage and not a transitory stage. So along um, the way we come up with the what is transgender model and up until recently transgenderism um, was considered a gender identity disorder and it was mostly a medical research field. Um, however, through activism um, and educators' awareness of this, um, we started to consider it as a human development model. And so enters Brent Bilodeau and he started doing work on um, transgender develop development. And he used DeJelly's model mostly and applied it to the transgender community. Um, again, it's multidimensional and fluid. And you'll notice that the six stages that I'll go through quickly, um, exiting the trans traditional gender, developing personal identity, social identity, um, becoming an offspring, intimacy status, and community sound very similar to Jigeli's. Balance between the self and community involvement, environment, political and social norms are very key in this development model. Um, so some limitations. Um, again, this is extremely new. Uh, Bilodeau's research all happened in the mid to late 2000s. Um, it also uh, only observes one or two campus communities in a very, very small um, sample size. Um, there is not very much diversity at all. So it's kind of like a greenhouse. It encases everything that we are learning about transgenderism in this very small space. So how do we put this into practice? Um, thinking about how we use our inclusive language with leadership selection and training our le student leaders on campus is very important. Um, offering locations and space for students to retreat and have self-reflection time. Providing campus center and community involvement um, through GLBTA centers and educating and creating a welcoming community on our campus. Um, uh, resources and faculty for our students to reach out to.
Of course, this is an extremely brief presentation and I just went through some really heavy models. So I really encourage you to go and research the full theories. Um, there's plenty of opportunity for further research in this field and I think that it's something to keep an eye on. Thank you very much.